Hello and welcome to the Grand Cinema Hotel, a podcast hosted by two friends who love cinema. I'm Oliver and I'm joined by my co-host Gus. Tonight you'll be staying in room 149, Tar, the newest film directed by Todd Field. So go ahead and get comfortable and throw on that do not disturb sign as we enter the drama of a Berlin orchestra with Tar. If you're here, then you already know who she is. Lydia Tar is many things. As a conductor, Tar began her career with the Cleveland Orchestra, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, the Boston Symphony Orchestra, until she had last arrived here at our own New York Philharmonic. In 2013, Berlin elected Tar as its principal conductor, and she's remained there ever since. Lydia Tarr has also written music for the stage and screen. She is one of only 15 EGOTs, meaning those who have won all four major entertainment awards. Thank you for joining us, Maestro. Thank you. and thank you for checking back in to the Grand Cinema Hotel. Tonight, we will be discussing one of the most talked about films of the year, what is likely to be a best picture contender, Todd Field's return to the cinema, Tar. I'm here with Alvaro, and uh, what was your first reactions, man? You saw this before I did. Yeah, Tar. Damn. So this movie is one of those that the trailer uh, just kind of captures your attention because it doesn't give out give away too much and um i am a sucker for classical music um drama type of films just because like well i like amadeus a lot and i think um that comes there's not many films that kind of have that kind of subject matter so this kind of always had my attention and i think i told you this that i didn't know who the director was and um i could just kind of tell through the trailer that this seemed like it would be something up our alley kind of and so i was just interested in checking it out i didn't know much about it i went in and i walked out feeling like i had just really seen a work of art honestly and i felt um kate blanchett's performance in this is so far i would say um th- for me it seems to be like the lead contender for the oscars i think this is probably her best role maybe ever but it definitely since i've been paying attention to her and i think uh the film is just masterfully crafted in every sense i think the editing is outstanding i think the shots are truly some of my favorite of the year and i even think the score comes in at very perfect times as well so i think this is just um a very masterfully crafted film okay nice nice i agree with a lot of what you said there um I was a little more familiar with Todd Field because I knew that he was the actor from Eyes Wide Shut. Mm-hmm. He played the piano player, Nick Nightingale, who got uh, Tom Cruise involved nice. in that story. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, I had never seen his movies. I just knew that that's who he was. Um, I had known that he made two other movies, but it was a very long time ago in the mm-hmm. mid-2000s. <laughs> it sounds funny to say a long time ago. But um, he's been kind of laying low-key for a while. And I didn't know what to really expect with this movie. The first time I heard of it was on the big picture. Uh, They were in the beginning of the year talking about the movies they were most excited for. And just the name tar. I was like, what, what, like that sounds like it's going to be an interesting movie. Right. Um, I don't, I honestly can't say if I even seen the trailer for the movie. I, I obviously didn't spend a lot of time at the movies this Mm -hmm. year as I uh, would in previous years. So I just knew I was interested in it and I knew I wanted to see it. And even when it originally came out, uh, because this is, I would say this is a couple of what, maybe a month or so after the release. Yeah. uh, That we're even doing this episode that I didn't uh, even understand what people were talking about when, you know, the memes and the jokes and the film Twitter got a hold of it. Yeah. I I had no, um, I had no bearing on what, the film was going to be yeah you know i didn't i thought the film would be about would be about being a genius but i really don't think that now that i've seen the movie i Mm. honestly think that this is a movie that deconstructs the myth of what it means to be a genius and um i don't want to get too ahead of myself but i think like uh it starts from the very beginning you know this movie has credits in the beginning instead of at the end And um, that alone, I feel like, helps deconstruct the myth of either the auteur or the solo genius. It's like you're going to sit here and be forced to pay attention 
to all of the people who actually made this happen and not just chalk it up to one writer director or in this case one composer as well so um I didn't really know what to expect, but I got something I enjoyed even more than I thought I would. Um, I do think that if this was just some um, classical music movie about how this person is such a genius and what it takes to be a genius, it wouldn't be as good. I do think it's very relevant to the times that we're living in. Mm -hmm. um, it's even a little subversive of uh, what you would typically see. Like, um, it, I found it quite ironic that they were playing a movie, uh, a trailer for a movie about the Harvey Weinstein scandal before this. And then I think that like, even just making that movie to me is poor taste, um, to like yeah, bastardize seriously. something that was real and then make it a fictional story like that or not a fictional story, but to just do that to something that is so fresh. Um, I think on the counter end, tar handles this kind of subject matter in a much more, um, I don't want to say confident, like a much more mature and um, real in a real way, I would say. Like it, it seems more it seems like it's not being dramatized, even though it's a, a, a drama movie. You know what I mean? No, yeah, I, I get that because I think there's even a comedic sense to bringing up the subject matter for Todd Field and this film even um, kind of giving us a persona of what who Lydia Tarr is and kind of as the story develops that kind of unravels itself. And I think there's a lot of commentary here of bringing up the subject matter of cancel culture, but I do think in a way he's not really taking a side on it. He's just presenting the subject matter for us to take what we want from it. And in terms of, you know, taking, um, presenting Lydia Tarr as a representative of what would be people against cancel culture and then presenting somebody who, gets canceled in this movie and whether how you feel about those situations i think you can kind of see um your beliefs be reflected onto the film and then how her downfall you could see it as a you know something good or something terrible and i think that's what makes the film yeah, very I accessible don't think that he presents it in a way that's like lydia tar is a bad person mm -hmm. you should hate her by the i think he just lays it out in a neutral way and it's up to the viewer to decide but, I mean, Lydia Tarr is um, a fascinating character, honestly. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of want to jump around uh, a little bit, but <laughs> the movie being about, like, cancel culture, I don't really think that you could handle it in a better way than this. Yeah. Because it's not hokey and it's not cheap feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and the movie itself, and I think in every aspect... It's quite subtle, even though it's about like um, like such high grade performance art. Mm. I think it's a very subtle movie in the way it's shot, in the way it's edited. The score itself is very subtle. I just think that um, like the joke going around that this is like the ultimate NPR movie. Like you really do <laughs> get that when you're going into this. You know, like it's not even presented in like in a, in a like an investigative sense. It's almost just like this. Like, it reminded me a lot of, and I know this might sound weird, it's Barry Lyndon, like the rise and fall of somebody mm -hmm. and how they can end up back to where they started. <laughs> and I don't want to get to the end yet because we'll talk about that later. Yeah. The, the quite comedic ending to this movie, but I couldn't help but think of Barry Lyndon when I watched this movie. I don't, I don't know if you if you felt that, but yeah, that was just something for me that really stood out, like the the story structure because it's a, it's a story about power and how it corrupts people or how they abuse their power. And especially with, with it being a, a powerful white woman instead of a white man. Like I heard Kate Blanchett and Todd field say that if this was a movie about a powerful white man who did this, that you would have decided in five minutes, like, okay, I don't need to see the rest of this movie. Fuck this guy. But because it's Lydia Tarr, she adds a whole nother layer of complexity to this story. And I just couldn't help but see the Barry Lyndon similarities throughout, like the the rise and fall of this character and like the rise to power and the the fall down. Yeah, I see the similarities and that's what I was going to say. What makes this film kind of stand out for me is it has a pretty long runtime, but a lot of its uh, runtime in the first and even second act are so preoccupied with you identifying with Lydia Tarr and the kind of just really groundbreaking persona she is in this world and almost making it... Um, seem like she is real 
Like I know some of we were on Google right now and people were like, is it based on a real story? Like Lydia Tarr does feel like it'd be a person that you wouldn't know about that's probably done so much. And I think that really happens in the movie. Like you feel that way in that movie because a lot of its runtime in the beginning is so meant to establish this character, the type of person that she is, the type of relationship she has with all these people in her orchestra um, and the types of things that she does behind the scenes. And then so this movie kind of feels like in the third act for me really almost in the same way the music does it it starts to elevate to different um tempos and kind of start going higher and higher and higher up until the climax kind of comes out of nowhere and that's kind of where the film kind of starts to tackle the seriousness of quote-unquote cancel culture but i still don't think like you said i don't think it's very heavy-handed in that and i think it's um that's why it works so well it's had this film been a little shorter I don't think it would deliver as well. Yeah, I think it's I perfect mean, runtime. Yeah, I I don't know. That's always a hard one for me to be like, this movie is exactly as long as it needed to be, or it's as it, it's as short as it needed to be. I I, I don't know. You know, yeah. uh, runtimes in movies they really only bother me if the movie's bad, and this was not a bad movie. But it was also the type of film where I did kind of you know, what time is it? You know, <laughs> I feel yeah. like damn, I've been in here a long time. Um, I do think that just had. Maybe that has to do with the stuffy boringness of the industry itself, like the classical music. Like it feels very educational. Like the the place where they are, where most of the movie takes place, feels like a college, even though it's not. Like um, I don't know. It's just a very stuffy, like dark, damp movie, you know. And maybe that has something to do with the Berlin setting. But um, I do think just that that like subtle gray damp world that they live in really does kind of add to the, um, the runtime in my, in my perspective. I see what you're saying. You know what I mean? It's just like, damn, this place feels like bad vibes. (laughs) Yeah. And I guess to me, I do feel like that atmosphere is there on purpose to really, uh, juxtapose the atmosphere we get in the end. You know, I I mean, I'm not saying it in a bad way. I'm just saying like, I do think that those are just now that I'm working it out in my brain of like, why did it feel so long? And I thought it was just because of that like stuffy NPR stuff. You know what I mean? I wouldn't say this is boring, but this is definitely not the most uh, exciting thing I've ever watched. Uh, Although it is very exciting, but it's just that's that's not an an emotion that uh, I felt very strongly while i was watching the movie i realized i was watching something good but it wasn't like i was like "Woo, hell yeah i'm watching tar <laughs> it's just like oh this is a very very good movie um i wouldn't go on the limb to say that this is like a masterpiece but i do think that this is very close to being one i think that this is probably one of the better movies of the entire year and um i'm excited to get more into it but i think we should kind of roll it back a little bit mm-hmm. um I kind of wanted to talk about Todd Field a little bit more. This is just, you know, random podcast fun stuff is uh, I know you said recently you discovered that he uh, invented Big League Chew, right? Like, that's not like that's common knowledge I knew, but I I had heard that once the press tour started. Um, (laughs) What the fuck, right? Like, some people just have the most interesting lives. That's what I was going to say is why it's interesting to bring him up. It's like, this is why this guy probably hasn't made a movie in 16 years, because he's fucking rich as fuck from Big League 2. Why would he ever need to, you know? I actually did read, though, he has no... No connection to it anymore? No, like, he... They say he invented it because he started making what is Big League Chew, but his name is not attached to what yeah. was sold. So it's not like he's making any money off of it, but they're saying that he's the one that actually uh, invented it because he was trying to get the baseball players off tobacco. Yeah, so, and I mean, the story goes is that he, he was a bat boy for a minor league baseball team owned by Kurt Russell's father, Bing. <laughs> And so that Kurt cool. Russell also played on this baseball team. Nice. And that uh, one of the pitching coaches in Todd Field invented this you know, big league chew formula in the field family kitchen around the time of being like 15, 16 years old. And then, I mean, from what you're saying here is that like, I guess that's kind of the end of it, right? For him. But then he goes on to be like a budding jazz musician who's playing in these big uh, like orchestra groups and stuff like that. So I do think that that's probably where the idea stems from Mm -hmm. of like this, of why choosing this industry versus any other because i do think if this was about the film industry this would be more heavy-handed and i think it's because you put it in this rarely seen world like i don't know how to say this in a nice way but this is not like commoner shit you know what i mean like your next door neighbor is not like yo do you know who lydia tar is her shit bangs you know know what i mean like this is like college educated npr fucking i i um i'm in a yacht club type of entertainment and the music you know? makes fun of i mean i think the the film makes fun of that 
Yeah, I in mean, various I don't think ways. It's saying that it, that's a good thing. I mean, you look at it and you're just like, you know, two regular Joes like me and you are like, these people are fucking nerds. Yeah, <laughs> these people are whack. So <laughs> I, I think that's the movie makes fun of that, and I, that, that's where I think it's just outstandingly wrote, or the script is just very well written. Written, yeah. Um, yeah. So Todd Field, you know, he's a musician. He becomes an actor. He um, he's in Woody Allen movies. Or he's in uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Stanley Kubrick. You movie. know what I mean? So he's had a very a very wide ranging career and doing many different things. He's what also a cool life. TV. He's been a TV actor for a very long time. And then he directs a movie called In the Bedroom that gets five Oscar nominations. He has three overall. Um, so when this guy does make a movie, it hits. But um, I haven't really paid too much attention to what the down period in his life has been. Maybe it is just kind of not feeling the need to make a movie like it's a job, like it's just out of out of passion. passion. But I don't know, man. I just I, I can't help but feel like kind of sucks we haven't had more todd field movies when these are the kind of things that he's capable of i think that's why they're probably so good they're not driven by anything besides i have a great idea it's taking me a while to think about this one or i haven't been in the mindset to want to make one and i I think that's cool as well this movie comes from a project that was un or unfinished it was a uh he was working with joan didion to make a movie and they were in talks to have kate blanchett start in, uh, star in the movie so that's where they met and um he kind of started kicking the idea around like i would like to work with her like she she's one of the best actor or well, actors in in the world she um kind of embodies who lydia tar is but as an actor instead like i that's why i think the performance is so good is because that's how i see kate blanchett but in the acting world, not in the yeah. classical music world. And um, she's such a good actor that I believe that she could do all of this. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know that she learned how to do, um, she learned composing stuff from like YouTube of all places. Um, she picked back up the piano that she hadn't played in many years to play some of the stuff in here. So this is very much written for Kate Blanchett. Mm-hmm. And this movie would not have seen the light of day if she had not agreed to be in it. So, I just think that um, the fact that he's been kicking this idea around for so long without any like repercussions of I need to make money or I need to whatever that that's why like this is actually a piece of art and not just a a product like another movie that we talked about recently. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just the varying degrees of filmmaking, and this just yeah it doesn't seem pressured at all. And I think that's why it's the movie. Even in its pacing, it's so meticulous. Yeah, and I know that he has been mentored by Stanley Kubrick. Of well, it was one of many mentors to him, and I did feel like the movie. Maybe just because I knew the whole Nick Nightingale thing before I saw Tar, that I was just like, I'm expecting this to be like Kubrickian. You know what I mean? And I wouldn't say it exactly like gives me the exact emotions of a Stanley Kubrick movie, but just that cold, calculating like precise subtlety and um also those those like comedic jabs that you get throughout the movie then i'm like this does feel like the kind of movie that stanley kubrick would make but because he's he you can't replicate him i mean obviously it doesn't feel like that shot for shot but i just felt a lot of that coming through and i'm like i could see where this is the stuff that you learned from him because it does feel a lot like what you get from him i think it how it's just so character driven is something that always kind of stands out to me for Kubrick films, and this seems to have um, again because it's Kate Blanchett, and I think Stanley Kubrick had a great way of picking his lead roles too. But Kate Blanchett here is um, just outstanding, and I think um, the fact that she believes this character is a person as well, I think, just really radiates onto the screen, and like I said, it almost ties into the real world. And they use a lot of uh, real world composer names and they just kind of subtly throw her in there. And so I, I, I do think the um, I, I could see the resemblance to Kubrick films here just in terms of how the characters developed. Yeah, I mean, I honestly I see it in other ways, too. That's just like that patience and command over your movie. Like when I think of someone who is in control of their movies, that's who I think of is Stanley Kubrick, like of all people. And I do think that that's why when we have directors who feel like they're in such charge of the thing that they're making is why we we think of him. And um, I just 
Yeah, I just I couldn't help but feel a lot of Stanley Kubrick in this movie, and I'm sure that that's not something he would openly say. Like, yeah, I wanted to make a movie just like him, but how could you not when this is the this is someone who has mentored you? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's almost like you know how they used to have like an uh, NBA, the Greg Popovich tree of coaching. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I could definitely see this being a branch of the Stanley Kubrick tree. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like Todd Field, um, and I don't really feel that from many other directors. It's not even. Who knows if Todd Field is like one of the best working directors? It's hard to say because he hasn't made in enough movies to even be in the conversation, really. But I, I just hope this isn't um, a one-off. You know, like I don't want to wait 16 more years for a, another movie from him. But yeah, who that's knows, true. You know. Um, also, we, you know, we talked about this a lot recently. Not even in terms of the podcast or movies, but just the idea of like recapturing lightning in a bottle. Who knows? This is such a good movie that maybe this is just like. I'm never going to have anything to say like I did about this movie and what the things I put into this movie. Detar. Yeah. It's the time that he took off from filmmaking into this. And if he starts making them more commonly, it may just be, this was a unique situation based off of, he didn't feel the need to make anything else or he really took all of you to perfect what he wanted for this one. Yeah. And then I know, we're kind of, you know, we're doing a little myth making here, you know, we're kind of big upping Todd Field and, uh, you know, the magic of making this movie. But it really isn't as um, meticulous as you would think. So this movie was made in the middle the in the middle of the pandemic. Right. Focus features reaches out to him and tells him you can make whatever movie you want. Um, you can write whatever you want. We're not going to give you any notes and we're not going to have any um, we're not going to have any hold over this. This is all going to be you. And uh, he wrote it in, uh, I think he said, 12 weeks. Or, uh, so it's not like this is something that has been like, oh, I've been His, struggling for 15 years to write this perfect movie. Like, no, he was just like, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> like, They're down. Yeah, and I do think that it, it kind of helps with the like the deconstructing the myth of the auteur. You know what I mean? It's like this was just kind of something that I don't want to say he just shitted it out, but it was just like, oh, I have this really good idea. And if you don't hinder me and you let me – um, complete my vision like I think I'm going to give you something pretty good and I just don't understand why more studios are not allowing directors to do this yeah maybe what it's the fuck, simple, right? yeah, maybe it's what simple makes Todd thing. feel so special to have this um you of all people who hasn't made a movie in 16 years you get to do whatever you want no notes but it's not like uh like we talked about Ryan Coogler recently very good filmmaker no one he's getting notes down the ass about like it has to be this 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 and he's not the only director you know it's not just a marvel thing it's just a studio thing it's a a numbers and analytics thing of well we've calculated this is exactly what the audience wants so i don't know why Todd Field of all people got this opportunity but good on him and what a way to um <laughs> he ooped the alley you know what i mean yeah. like he finished the dunk like okay you're gonna let me do whatever i want watch this you're, you're not gonna regret it i do think they let certain directors do what they want and it doesn't come out good so i, I do think there has to be some credit towards maybe what he does shit out is still better than some of the stuff that people think of and some people are just like that so yeah, maybe he's I like mean, that whatever i get it i mean his life also, is crazy yeah it's, i it mean is. yeah but so to that point I do think that as artists, shouldn't they be allowed room for mistakes? You know, why should it be just because you made one bad move? Well, now you're banished, you know, I, and I understand it's all profit driven at the end of the day, but if you're looking at this from the artistic point of view, like, of course you're going to make a bad painting or like a really bad one, but it doesn't mean you could never make anything good again, you know? And yeah. that's kind of where we are with some directors. They get one shot and then it's, then it's over. You know, like I, I really would like to dive into the, what the hell happened to Todd Field after I think it's called Little Children was his second movie. Like, why were they not lining up to just give him whatever he wanted or let him do whatever he wanted? I know that he wanted to stay away from doing uh, IP and superhero movies. I don't know why they thought Todd Field would be like the right guy to do that. But I have heard him say on record that he just wasn't interested in what he was being offered either. So who knows? Maybe it's just a a really Sigma choice of him to be like, I don't need movies. (laughs) You know, I'll come back when I'm ready. But, uh, yeah, man, it's just such an interesting story, honestly, like from the director's sense. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's an interesting story. I'm trying to see if I could find anything based off of him saying well, what you was. You go ahead and look on that, and then I'll, how about I do the synopsis, and then we'll get into, or, well, would you rather do the crew or the synopsis right now? Because I do think we have to mention the crew on this. Yeah, definitely. I mean, synopsis, I think, and then heading into... Okay, so 
<sighs> Tar stars Kate Blanchett as Lydia Tar, a fictional world-renowned conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic, who is brought down for exploiting power to pursue relationships with younger protégés, including a woman who commits suicide. The maestro is in denial regarding the influence of social media in the age of cancel culture. Contributing to her uh, to her undoing is a searing, impolitical exchange she had with a BIPOC Juilliard student that goes viral. While Field and Blanchett consider the film something of a fairy tale in that no top-tier orchestra today is led by a female conductor, Tar nevertheless upends the prevailing narrative in making a powerful woman a potential predator. So, yeah, I mean, honestly, I did not expect that to be the movie from the trailer. Like, I really did think that it's just going to be like, oh, this is about this musical genius and the, the, the amazing music she makes in the process. So I was totally caught off guard that this was the movie. And um, I don't want to be like, this is a brave movie to make. But, yeah, that really is like a, hmm, I'm going to do something nobody else is doing. Uh, what if women were bad, too? Yeah, he's like, a cancel culture. How far can it go? Would you cancel this lady, right, Would for you doing something? Would lesbian for doing this? Yeah. yeah. Or is and, it just... Uh, yeah, I mean, the answer is yes, they would. Yeah, they would. <laughs> so, I did want to get to the crew. I know you said to do the synopsis, but they have to be mentioned. Like, that's really the lifeblood of this film and what makes it so good. And, like, I know we talked about a lot, a lot about Todd uh, Field and Kate Blanchett, but, like you said, the cinematography in this movie, you really enjoyed it, and the editing as well, right? Mm-hmm. So the cinematographer is uh, Florian Hoffmeister. Um, I, I was not really familiar with him, so I went and checked out his filmography because, you know, usually you cinematographers are so much different than directors in, in that they make so much that you never know if you've actually seen one of their movies or not, you know? So like I saw that he did, um, antlers, right? yeah, he did antlers, right. Which I did not like. And then, um, we had to figure out after the movie, was it like, is that movie just really dark or was the projector really bad? Right. And I do think it was both in our screening because the projector was like kind of flickering right Mm -hmm. like if i didn't have a list i'd want my money back but then when i saw that he did antlers i was like oh okay (laughs) i can Mm -hmm. totally see that these are these are somewhat your creative choices of like no it should be this dark (laughs) (laughs) uh some other ones i saw that he did was johnny depp's movie mordecai do you know what that is it's I've like heard of really it, but I haven't. Bad, dumb movie. Like it was. It was part of the uh, Johnny Depp downfall after Alice in Wonderland. Oh no! Um, and then another one that I just thought was hilarious was Johnny English Strikes Again, <laughs> and uh, once again proving that you really are just a hired hand unless you are a top tier director who gets to pick your projects. You know, like mm-hmm. he did Johnny English and Mordecai because he needed the bag. You know, maybe Antlers was was a just a bag move too. You never you never know, right? I always think of like the cinematographer and Nope, how he's filming the. Uh, the commercial for them yeah and he's like this is not what i want to be doing <laughs> i want to make oscar movies yeah <laughs> exactly yeah, but like i think the editor here does have more of a say on what she does or maybe this specific editor does because she's done stuff like the piano teacher and yeah more meticulously um this is more films that, are, that she's more familiar yeah with. you could tell that she does these types of films and that's why i think the editing is honestly just uh, top tier i think she knows how to maintain tension that this film really does and i think the editing takes it a long way to make like maintain this film a pressure cooker yeah and i do think and i've been saying this a lot and i really don't mean this in a bad way at all but the subtlety of this movie i do think that no one performance or um piece of the like technical side of the movie is show showboating or being like um braggadocious and the like look at this editing look at this soundtrack look at this you know other than kate blanchett's performance but that's integral to the movie like exactly. that is the point of the movie is that this person is making it all about them when it really is a entire team that does this like if you really want to make this for a five-year-old it's like this is about why this movie is about why you need to be a team player and not just me 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 because eventually these people will be part of your downfall for how much you've you know just minimized them and made them feel less than because they're not the conductor you know so i do think that that subtlety throughout throughout the movie and all these different levels just really adds to the idea of like the film makers feeling like the orchestra too you know what I mean? Like, I think it's a through line that goes through the production, through the credits, and through the whole film of this idea of, like, the the team is better than the, the individual. I can see that, yeah. Yeah, so that's why I do think I've been using that word subtle, but I just think it's because, yeah, they they really are on that. Like, no one person is bigger than the entire 
thing. And um, I would say the composer, <laughs> Hildur uh, Gudin daughter, is uh, we all know her, we all love her because she did Joker, okay. you know, the Joker dance. Yep. <laughs> but she is the like honestly, she's one of the ones right now. Like, so she's thing too, Lydia Tar. Yeah, she <laughs> for real. She um. She has done the scores for some of the best movies of the past like 10 years. So Prisoners, Sicario, Arrival. I wouldn't exactly say The Revenant is one of the best movies, but that is a um, a movie movie. You know what I mean? Like that's a big eventized film. It's got the biggest movie star in the world. You have one one Oscar. the directors. So. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but just, yeah, The Revenant fits in with these other movies that I'm talking about. She's also done Chernobyl, which I think is one of the best pieces of television in the past decade. Um, yeah, Joker, we all know it. You all love this. You know, you all love it. You could argue that that's like one of the best parts of the entire movie is that fucking score. Like without it, who knows how we would really feel about that movie. I feel like that movie, that movie is carried by that like haunting, just desolate score that she made. Um, and yeah, now with Tar, I, I don't feel like she was uh, put here to be the star of the show, but that it's used in all of the in all of the right ways, mm -hmm. you know. So I just wanted to shout her out because she's one of the best working musicians in you know the world of classical music and the world of film scores. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so shout out Hilder. <laughs> yeah, shout out Hilder. Yeah, so we can dive into the movie a bit. Um, I mean, from this point on, we, you know, we've talked about this, we've danced around. Do you want to just like get into the movie? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I think it's enough time to kind of spoil this joint No. Yeah. Okay. I agree. So where do you want to start then? Do you want to start with the star of the movie? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, we see Kate Blanchett, Lydia Tarr's character, like I said, through the first and second act, very heavily established as this genius who maestro, right? Um, What's well, in the first 20 seconds of the actual movie? Once you get past the unbelievable four minutes of credits that I can fucking stand sitting in. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. That was interesting. <laughs> yeah. We had a man in front of us, very old. Uh, me and Alvaro have seen a lot of movies this weekend. We've probably spent about 12 hours in the movie theaters over the past two days. And uh, old people just talk at normal volume. I don't know if they can't hear, so they are just screaming their lungs out, but... <laughs> After about the second minute of credits, the guy in front of us, are you serious? <laughs> I was like, I understand there's only two other people here besides you. And but we were talking about maybe we're being haters on boomers here right now. But like, don't you remember when movies were like this? Yeah. Like you specifically? You don't remember yeah. when like people You're 70 years old. You don't remember that this is how movies were. Yeah. But God, I actually, you know, I, I enjoy it because I think it is kind of what you're tying to um, showing that what you're about to see was brought by a team. Because I feel like a lot of people, besides in Marvel movies, they leave as soon as the movie's done. Like they don't stay for the credits. The best thing that Marvel has ever done is to give you a bone for sitting and acknowledging the people who made the yeah. movies. You know, even though you don't. Because, yeah, even though you don't. Even though you don't. Uh, exactly. Because me and you have seen what twenty five post credit scenes. Yeah, and I couldn't tell you who one name made a Marvel. That's movie. not yeah <laughs> one name from the VFX. Yeah, no. one name, yeah. but. It, um here it is even though again we do not care at least i have to see it to start the movie i don't have to like at the end it's done it's not so i have actually always would rather have the credits be in the beginning and then i do miss when they used to make creative shots for those credits yeah, where yeah. it was just giving like you ambiance Disney fairy tales or something like exactly. that where it'd be like the storybook pages changing or <laughs> uh yeah, just made, like I always think of something like Gone with the Wind or like Casablanca, exactly. Or, or like, like the, it wasn't used this way, but the Green Knight when it's just the the donkey and all of the farm animals just kind of that, that would could have been be a perfect sequence. For exactly. Yeah, exactly. So it's you, you're you're being put in the world, and you're also like okay, you're still also gonna this is who did this 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 all the people that worked on it like look my name's up there. Yeah. So I wanted to go back to your point about that establishing Lydia Tarr as the successful genius. It is. Um, she does a New Yorker interview in the very beginning, mm -hmm. which is like more of this just like snobby stuffiness. You know what I mean? Like this movie is proud of is proud of that fact. And then, like you said, it also deconstructs it, deconstructs it and makes fun of the mm -hmm. fact that it's like this. Yeah. But, you know, books, films, uh, music, these these places are like that. You know, like a lot of it on the higher end level is just like this pretentious stuffiness of like well this is highbrow art and i mean 
I would like to think that we're like, you know, we're the common folk who can appreciate the high art, but we don't walk around like we're better than anybody because, you know, I don't wear a suit and a tie because I'm going to go see a film tonight. You yeah, know I mean? exactly. And that's just, uh, that's you, that's the world you're instantly put into. And you see how even within this world, Lydia Tarr is probably one of the most accomplished people, like, living on the planet right now. Like, her her laundry list is, about, like, as long as Santa Claus's fucking list of her accomplishments. And, I, I, mean? and I did, like, actually kind of how the film after a second rewatch kind of made me stand out. This stand out to me is that there is a livid hater already from the beginning of the movie. And somebody that we don't really see is on the, we just get a lot of phone shots of somebody kind of they're being screen recording or not. They're, they're live recording her on IG. It yeah. Looks like. That's what it's like. It says live on it, you know, but because movies are not explicitly allowed to say their Instagram. You're like, wait, what is this? Because exactly you're watching an Instagram live, but then I, f- I message bubbles are popping. Like, that's Exa- not how that works. Exactly. <laughs> that's how I wanted to touch upon that because it's like, I believe they're putting her on live to people are just smack talking her, but I don't know what exactly it's entailing. But what I do get from it is that there is somebody who is with her, who is a silent hater. Yes. And also you, you see one of the texts, but we'll say it's like, so you do still love her like question mark. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's one of the themes throughout the entire movie with every character is this like love, hate power relationship that you have with Lydia Tarr. And it's like, you want to be on her good side because of the things that, you know, come exactly. from it, but everybody fucking hates her guts. Cause she's a shitty fucking person. person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, it's just, it's right there from the opening scene, you know? And like we talked about with that, uh, interview in the beginning, it's like a promotional tour for everything she's got going on. Right. She's going to do, um, Mahler symphony number no. five. She is a, uh, a disciple of Mahler uh, in his classical music. Uh, and this part of the film too really does like solidify that. Like, is she a real person? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I do think that that's probably why the, um, the, uh, some of the audience members wanted to kind of like confirm this person sounds real. Yeah. Like, low key. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, again, because Kate Blanchett does such a good, uh, such a good job in, humanizing this character and being able to fit her in a way that you would consider composers carry themselves and then somebody of her sexual orientation forefronting a very male dominated um you know occupation and i think because she does such a good job you i can definitely see why somebody would question but wait is this person real like is Kate blanchett playing homage to somebody we should know yeah she feels she feels like it's, it's like what I said earlier about Kate Blanchett. Like this is a phenomenal performance, but it also does feel a bit like it's just Kate Blanchett mm-hmm. well, because, and I, I just think that her presence on and off the screen, whether it's on stage or in an interview or whatever, she gives that like regalness. It, you yeah, know what exactly. I mean? of, like she feels like somebody who's important just when she takes a breath to talk. And you know, when she's fucking ordering a water bottle on the phone, you're like, who am I talking to? That's you know Kate Blanchett. I mean? yeah. yeah. There's only one. Yeah. So we, um, you know, we also we also get the like everything we need to know about her from the beginning you know like i wouldn't say like political leanings but like her ideology on these like new sensitive matters in the world of like sexual orientation or um, what it means to be a successful woman you know like and that's kind of where she paints herself in like this is a um, probably a bad comparison but like how kanye west has recently referred no, to exactly. himself like i'm on the way to being a powerful white male you know what i mean like lydia tar kind of shows that same like I'm a I'm a white lesbian woman, so I might as well be a white, white man. powerful man. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean. So she doesn't really see herself as a um, not a martyr, but like a a. Uh, no, she broke she broke the glass ceiling, as they yeah, say. Yeah, she broke the glass ceiling, but she doesn't really fucking like accept that role. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I don't yeah. want to be seen like no. that, and it's it's kind of. Um, kind of leans into what you would you're going to realize later is like her more conservative leanings you know i did think that her um we'll get to it in a little bit but her juilliard video that goes viral it kind of just shows you that like maybe this person has become this way because of the idea of like the power and the genius like she she maybe she was like that student one day but then because of who she's become and the image and the persona of lydia tar the genius 
now she's more conservative and like you see it in her suits you see it in the way she like the meticulous mannerisms of everything she does of like this is a person who's like running on 100 percent tailored you know suits. I mean? like tailored yeah everything is perfect everything is like conservative <laughs> everything like, yeah. she's like the perfect conservative person you know what i mean except the only difference between her and a real conservative is that she's actually can make good art <laughs> she's the, she's the type of woman in this film portrayed that like if um she would never wear something that was outlandish you know or that's something that would show too much everything was very calculated she's meant to look like as a professional white male as much as she could yeah so we also get an introduction to her assistant who is like the person she honestly leans on the most mm -hmm. um that's francesca she's played by noemi merlant uh if you've seen portrait of a lady on fire that's what you would recognize her from as her breakthrough role um she is the aforementioned silent hater, I, yeah. I'm guessing. Right? That's what like I think, yeah. It's implied from the beginning and from what takes place in this movie, you kind of, you know, it's kind of obvious. You're like, okay, this is the person that was a huge part of your downfall. And it was someone that was overlooked. It was someone that was probably most likely abused. It was someone who dealt in sexual favors to maybe get to the position that she's in. And um, how Lydia just uses her uses her really you know so it's a complicated relationship between the two of them because it's like master and student but also it's got all these other like really fucking deep complex like i don't know how to talk about this really this you, relationship you know I mean? this relationship <laughs> reminded me of like what we do in the shadows with guillermo and his you know what i mean but to the worst degree <laughs> it's a good everyman yeah, reference exactly you know what I, mean? <laughs> like, I i think it was just like a, but what if Again, no payoff for doing all of these things, but you know, trying to be a vampire is like, nah, damn, that's always <laughs> it's, it's it's worth it. But for this, it's like, dude, she's she has the she met the criteria, but she wasn't selected. You yeah, know, like she's literally, like, she's literally Isaiah Thomas. <laughs> <It's> just, um, <laughs> so yeah, you know, within the first five minutes, we're learning everything about Lydia Tarr, some of the relationships that she um, has going on in her life. We also realize that, um, or it's brought up in the interview that her concert master, lead violinist, uh, partner in life, partner in raising a child, is part of the orchestra, and they mm -hmm. ask her like, "How do you?" How do you navigate the balance between your personal and professional life? And we learn later on in the film that it isn't through Lydia. Like they don't a call genius, She can't handle her own personal life. The, the wife played by Nina Haas, her name is Sharon in the movie. She is really the one holding this yeah. image of Lydia Tarr together. <laughs> you don't really, you know, because the movie's subtle, you don't see it. But like, this is really someone's descent into like madness. You know what I mean? But it's done in that NPR way of like. And then I went crazy. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, seriously. Yeah. No, but it's like the answer to that was they didn't. She did. And I think a lot of what I think stood out to me a lot, um, since we're talking, talking about the the crew or the cast. Well, the cast. The cast because are, it's, all, it's all laid out in in that order. Exactly. Know? But I don't I don't have the little girl's name, oh, her Petra. daughter. But um, she refers to Lydia as Lydia. You know, Very which is professional and stuffy. Like yeah. And it's like we know from later on. That that is the name she chose to be go, like go as, yeah. and it's just interesting that her daughter goes like also calls her that. It's the persona. This genius is so into the person that she is. I'm yay. You yeah. refer to me as yay. I couldn't help but think of the maestro episode of Seinfeld. It's like no, you must call him the maestro. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't call him Ralph or whatever the fuck his name yeah, is. No, you know, the you know, you refer to me as the maestro. And the fact that you have that dynamic. I know you have a child and. It's like you She's gonna have to call me the pod father. Never call me dad. Exactly. <laughs> so it's it. But it really is an interesting dynamic to have with your child. Yeah. That and, professional like you are the student and I am the master. They have um, some short time in the movie where they have scenes together. Kate Blanchett and her child. And she's kind of always teaching her a song, you know, kind of always trying to get her to almost indulge into what she is being a composer I'm get you to like the thing i like but in a way that you don't understand and yeah. this just plays more into the manipulative manipulative nature of mm -hmm. power you know what i mean she's like so she's good at it to even her little her daughter you know and really i mean i don't want to portray it in a negative way because it's the only positive relationship in her life yeah exactly but also because you know these are common themes in movies she's the typical like bad parent you know she's here for five minutes she uh she puts onto her what she wants her to like and then okay i gotta go back to new york or i have to go stay in my other apartment like i couldn't help but think i was like damn lydia tar reminds me of like don draper and Mad yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's how I see her, you know? And, like, they really succeeded in this idea of this woman being looked at like a powerful white, white man. man. <laughs> you know? And and that's what I mean is uh, even in the way that Kate Blanchett does not wear makeup at all, I think, in the whole movie you know it is just very busted no, I'm yeah <laughs> well, no no which the only reason i bring it up is really she's interesting because we watched yeah we watched nightmare alley and she's portrayed as somebody who has sex appeal and very quickly can become that figure so i think again just shows to the range that kate blanchett has and to be able to do it a role like this um which like i've said i know she's she's royalty in hollywood but this role just seems so perfect for her and also to elevate her to what we all really do think of her as and i, I th again I, I i think that lydia tar only works so well because kate blanchett took helm of it and really took took that role like kind of almost in a way like i got you todd field you know yeah. I, I know what you wanted to do with this exactly um so moving the story along a bit um you know we get the we get the relationships kind of set in place and um, we see the book tour. So we're well on our way of like, this is, this is Lydia Tarr and this is her life. Um, she has lunch with a man named Elliot Kaplan, who mm -hmm. is a, a like successful businessman who's kind of helping front this whole operation, but it's really because he wants to be a conductor yeah. himself. So it's also like predatory Again, in nature and yeah. trans, like transactional. Like mm -hmm. everything is about how this, the movie itself really is about like the deconstructing the genius myth, but also deconstructing the idea of art being art for the sake collaborations. of collaborations. No, 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 no. This is all exploited in exactly. every single aspect of it. And yeah, Lydia Tarr might have broke the camel's back, but she is also being exploited and she's doing exploiting to other people and it's just this nasty nasty web of nasty yeah, very nasty <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it really is a very nasty movie you know like and it's but they sell it with that subtle npr fucking oxford button-up shirt you know what yeah. i mean of like you feel like what's going on is very normal, but then when you start digging at it, you're like, this is fucked up. This is grimy. This is, and, and that's why I think I, this is the, high class grind. It being yeah. in Berlin in that gray, disgusting type of atmosphere is like, that's why. Because it's like, this, would go, this is what goes Berlin. down here. I know we yeah. just called you gray and disgusting, but like, I know but you're not actually like movies that. Are, movies portray <laughs> you this way. They always shoot you guys in the cloudy day that you guys have. <laughs> like, yeah. but, Europe, no sun. Yeah, exactly. No sun. None. Yeah. Everything's England. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a line in the movie where the her partner is telling her that every relationship that you have is transactional besides the one that's sitting in the other room and it's the one with her daughter and again just kind of goes in everything that you take in from watching this movie there's you know there's a lot of times with these movies where you think like what is the point of these movies but if you really do pay attention to what the characters inside a very well crafted movie like this are saying they're giving you the points of like this is all dirty this is all like what you're watching is how disgusting this world actually is even though um you know german orchestras or classical music is high revered art it's just not seen as something that you would expect these things but again you kind of take the mask off of these things and you really get to see how shitty it is. shitty it is and why and how like the artist has to suffer from the like the the want to make art but then the world that it lives in is they don't they're not conducive with each other they don't mesh like lydia tar is a character who has overachieved a character who was not meant to go this far in life and a character who has taken what a lot of people say who have made it to the top has got to be like she was just being all about herself. Yeah. And she took that white man route all the way up. But this movie shows that you will fall like a white man, too, <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you want to take that route. And, so, you know, that's where that's where we get kind of so more she, into the second more lunch, act. And then she has an, another lunch. Right. Yeah. With a more senior member of the, that's what all these people the board do. of whatever. Yeah. They all have two hour lunches and just sit and talk about how they're geniuses. <laughs> right. Um, she floats an idea of uh, releasing her uh, her guest conductor at the moment because, you know, he's old and tired and washed. You know, we we need to move on. We need to go past this. Um I'm getting them confused if the the uh, the speech to the student and the that second lunch what order they're in, but I really wanted to go there next because I feel like that's one of the um, like match points in this movie. Like this kind of starts setting the fire too. Of like, oh, okay, this is gonna go to these places. Like the, about the the cancel culture, the wokeness, the. I think anyways, this the speech to the student is before um, they're trying to get the old conductor out. 
Okay, no, no, no. So it is first. It is first. Yeah, the, we get retro. The, we need to get retro. Important scene, man. though. Very yeah. important so, scene. Um, I wanted to do her to talk about her guest class at Juilliard, mm -hmm. right? Because this is more of the um, like the combative nature of these two of the young artist versus the established artist, and how I think she became more conservative over time. Yeah, um, I do think that a young Lydia Tarr who would have been in this student's position, maybe she also would have scoffed stood at up for these things. Yeah. And no, we need to push the medium forward. We need to be experimental, whatever. But now that she is established, and now that she is seen like someone like Bach or Beethoven, that. You know, she's starting to see the other side. Like, there's always that old joke about, like, every liberal grows up to be a Republican once they have a house and kids. Exactly. But, <laughs> um, you know, once you have your own family, you start feeling real conservative about how you feel about the world. You know what I mean? So, in Lydia Tarr's case, she's arguing with this student who um, he bases his passion off of, like, his, his the moral rights and wrongs of how he sees the world. So he doesn't want to listen to Bach. He doesn't want to listen to Beethoven because these people who he feels were filled with hate that he could never relate to the, the art that they made. Like, it wasn't made for him. As a BIPOC? Yeah, as a BIPOC. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> as a, um, yeah it's, it's, it is a little cringe to see these things in movies because, you know what, honestly you will always be looked at as a little cringe if you stand up for yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're like, no, I'm going to stand on my two feet and argue this with you that like, this is how I feel about things. And I don't care if you're Lydia Tarr, you're not going to change my fucking mind on how I feel. Exactly. So it's a very important scene because, you know, it comes up later in the downfall of, of her, but we just really kind of get this idea of like, damn, like, okay, she's a genius, but, like, she's a real fucking asshole. <laughs> I think I mean? this scene is so important because it does come in, in the first act and just really establishes where the film is going to go, as you've said, and um, I, I, I just think it really breaks down how realistic somebody from our age, a little younger, would approach a situation like this. I don't know how many, you know, dual racial students there was at this school even 20 years before that, so this student is bringing in new points of view new you know realizations yeah, exactly, to how to exactly. forward things like how many people of color were at juilliard 25 years ago or when lydia tar was there that would have even pushed this message of diversity or maybe like you know what fuck that colonizer i don't like his music yeah how about that so <laughs> it's like exactly if you're like i think that's why it opens a dialogue and people who i don't really identify myself with somebody who's that liberal because i'm not that i don't um, identify with things that are marginalized so i don't really feel like i have any room to speak but i do think that it's important to them to be able to be heard in those situations of um who would a bipoc person actually really listen to and does the school care care okay, about those people yeah and like do they put those people on the same pedestal or because they also weren't informed they are not informed by these people and i think that's where the conversation would open in a regular type of situation but lydia tar like you said having become a classical almost white auteur it's kind of taking it now like why would you judge these people off of their sexual preferences for like we just judge them off their music which it's i think easy to say when you've never been judged for anything else exactly and then i think that's where the the movie again todd field doesn't necessarily side with any of them but because this happens in the first act you kind of walk out as in feeling lady tar's kind of an asshole and this kid has his point um but also opens the dialogue in terms of if Lydia Tarr as herself is a genre breaking, rule breaking, breaking the glass ceiling type of character that she is now, is she not what a BIPOC person would want from a from like who <laughs> yeah, she yeah, yeah, like the type of person that you would want to break through? But ironically also the person now, how you said the liberal having turned Republican, because now she's also like, wait, actually yeah, and it's like you said, like I was, I think the word I was looking for earlier was like, she's not a hero for the marginalized because she doesn't see herself that way. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it's yeah. kind of, the, you know, this is what, this is one of the big talking points of like, nobody, nobody is supposedly more marginalized than white women, right? Mm -hmm. Like but from their point of view, you don't know how hard I've had it as a white woman. <laughs> like, so imagine being a black woman or imagine being an Asian woman yeah. or imagine being a gay person of color mm -hmm. be like, Wait, <laughs> you're probably the, you were the second most powerful group. What are you talking about? You're more marginalized. Exactly. You know I mean? You're still, yeah. So and she, even though she is groundbreaking, she's not really because she's groundbreaking in a world where the ground has never been broken. Exactly. It's it's it um it's a shame that it would be because I think reading up into this, there isn't a woman who leads an orchestra in any of the major orchestras in the world. And I don't think 
I don't, I'm not sure about this if it's ever happened. And if that's true, that is weird that not even a white woman has been able, or a Japanese woman, or whatever it may be, has not been able to break into any of she these. She reminds me much of Kamala Harris. We're like, oh, it's a woman. Oh, she sucks. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, oh Italy's getting their first oh, woman. Fuck, she's yeah. a cop. We're like, what are you talking? Oh, this sucks. <laughs> yeah, the Italians are getting their first woman. Oh, oh she, she likes Mussolini. Yeah, yeah. girl <laughs> boss Mussolini. That's Lydia Tar. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. I, I just think the scene is just really one of my favorite in the whole film. So I'm glad we walked back to it because it, it really just breaks down the sophisticatedness of this film because there's a lot of, of uh, you know, musical theory and just terms that we wouldn't be too familiar with as a general audience unless you've it's honestly. Yourself, I have culture. Yeah. <laughs> it, you know, but I, I think it also, besides that, a point, like besides that, the actual thing that you should be taking out of this is her point of view that weren't very established up until this point like her vocalizing where she stood on these things and that scene just really makes you i think start to realize who lydia tar is for the viewer yeah i mean she acts like a washed up person like you know she she acts like she is washed up mm -hmm. like one of those actors who's like you know what i actually really fucking like donald trump yeah like and that's the you know, liberal hollywood is the reason why i haven't been in anything in 20 years because they're all scared of the right you know like yeah. that's how lydia tar feels except she has this persona that you don't really you don't really want to like acknowledge that she might suck. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's worse that she sucks. You know, like, but come on, you're supposed to be yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. supposed to look up to you. Yeah, exactly. You got to separate the tar from the tardis. Tardis. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah. <laughs> and I love it's kind of hard to do that with Lydia. Um, I did want to get to the other, the other uh, scene where she speaks to her guest conductor and she, uh, lets him know that like we're gonna talk about we're talking about replacing you doesn't have to be today you know but get yeah, you shit, know, she's pretty you know? nice about it yeah exactly and that is where another kind of um the like the pressure cooker gets ratcheted mm -hmm. up as much as it can in this movie because mm -hmm. it is so subtle like you're never actually white knuckled sweating through this thing it's like this is the most relaxed i've ever been while i was stressed out about something <laughs> that's true um that you know the orchestra knows what you do. They know about your sexual favors. They know about your uh, fascination with these young women who come in here and how you make promises of uh, moving up the social ladder. If you know, th like the, the transactional nature of how Lydia Tarr treats being this conductor. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of leads to our big point that we haven't really spoke about at all, except for in the synopsis is this, uh, underlying character that kind of haunts the whole movie but we never really see her is the woman that lydia tar <laughs> you don't want to say forced into suicide but um you know walked her to the edge and how this is kind of just being ignored until it really can't be ignored much longer yeah not, now it's not just one thing it's a string of incidents that have led up to this and uh it's it's really fucking dark but it isn't it isn't played that way because of the the subtlety. I don't think my favorite. Uh, you're like, oh, this is what the fuck. <laughs> my favorite thing about this is watching it with you. I mean, that's not how emails work. Oh yes. And then it, well, but yeah. also it coming back to like that's literally what like. Lydia Tar got canceled because she's a boomer. She doesn't like come on. And also because she has somebody else who was the silent hater handling her emails. Yeah, I mean, everyone in Lydia Tarr's life is working actively against her, including herself. Because she's a bitch. Yeah, <laughs> Ooh, he threw that out there. She's not real, but Damn, he just called a fictional woman a bitch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but this is the main point of the movie. This is where the psychological aspect of the movie comes in because once this sets in, I don't want to say it becomes like a black swan, like psychological thriller movie because it's, it really doesn't it's very subtle on those things but you know the weird starts happening you know she starts getting sensitive to sound she's hearing you know random screams um, she's becoming very paranoid about the things going on around her and um, these are not unfounded claims you know like things really are being set in motion but it's all kind of playing out in her head versus in real life yeah i think that's where the movie kind of takes a the same way why we like Spencer, where it does kind of take more psychological type of, um, I, I would say, I'm lost at words here, but more of a that outlook into the movie because of that. Um, we get a scene where she does mess up her face because she falls, but she seems to be running from something that isn't chasing her. We do yeah. see a shadow, or at least what looks like a big dog. A dog. And, you know, but I also might... It's just interesting to me that she would assume because she's trying to chase down. Well, 
we later find out is oh. her attempt at her new toy eye candy, right? Yeah, her new toy, her new fresh meat. Yeah, um, but she's trying to chase her down and give her her bear. I just thought it was really interesting that she thought she lived. Okay, she had just walked away, what, like 20 seconds ago? And that she would live in that place where obviously nobody has lived in God knows how long. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah, there were stairs before she went that way. And like, why don't you think that maybe she went up the stairs, right? But yeah. that's that's, that's give movie her, stuff. That's movie stuff, right? Okay, but, cinema sins. But she necessarily, like I'm saying, she she messes up her face pretty bad for what seems like just all her psychological um, overthinking and well while all of this is going on in Lydia Tarr's life she decides to make it more complicated by kind of starting the process over again um, now that everything's kind of out in the open about we're going to have some replacements we're going to try to bring in some new people we instantly see that she's infatuated with this uh, young Russian cellist mm-hmm. who's going to audition for the orchestra and we see the power we see, you know we see the power at play here is the uh, Lydia Tarr kind of, I don't want to say um, she sways the vote in a way that probably shouldn't, it shouldn't Mm -hmm. be to get this girl into the orchestra. Um, She starts uh, lusting after her and not in a very, not in like an overt way, but you know, we, we start to see the, the gears start turning of like, oh, this is going to be my new girlfriend. Well, because it's, <laughs> uh, again, she's a genius. Nothing could be too overt. Nothing could be too obvious. But it has to be in terms of, you know, my lead celloist, I know you usually would just get to accompany me in this. But why don't we have tryout? Something that we've never done. Yeah. And it's like, well, I get you're not going to say no to Lydia Tart, But in your head, you're like, why? And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, you know how to play this? Maybe that'd be a perfect accompanying music to my piece. And it's like, hmm, how coincidental, right? And that's how she's working her to get that maybe where her assistant was at having that type of place for her and then probably just sticking her there when she's tired of her. Yeah, so at this point in Lydia in Lydia Tarr's life, <laughs> you know, her wife's not too happy with her. Her orchestra is not too happy with her. Her assistant has left because of this suicide. Um, we still are trying to figure out what the hell happened with this suicide because that is played throughout the entire film as the big, like, this is what I'm waiting for to be revealed. Um, and, you know, she start, she's trying to start this new awful relationship with this young cellist and it's just all starting to fall apart and peel away like layer by layer and i do think that that's why we get these these um these psychological moments of like hearing a woman screaming in the woods or thinking she's being chased or um the the metronome going off at night you know things being missing from her house so it's like the movie does get a a a slight bit spooky in some aspects you know we we find out it's connected to the blair witch project (laughs) universe for some (laughs) so like right across from uh tar happening the blair witch project was happening for some reason so that was interesting um i thought the other interesting thing though was that with this young cellist the feelings are not reciprocated this is Mm -hmm. the one person who kind of doesn't want anything from from lydia she L plus who are you? Yeah, plus your boomer. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know, we see many attempts at what might be the beginning of this new um like reality relationship dynamic between a boss and an employee. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um the the young Russian girl is not really reading the room, you know? I don't even think she understands the position that she's in of like, oh, I could use this to my advantage or I could use this to help take her down. Um I don't know if maybe I just missed it, but I thought throughout the entire movie, she never even really was kind of aware of all the surrounding stuff that was going on because she is played to be of the fish out of water in this world, you know? And maybe that is why Lydia had this like predatory feeling towards her of like, Oh, I'm going to take advantage of this. She's even this perfect girl yeah. to take advantage of, you yeah. know, in her fucking crazy ass mind. But yeah, I just, that was one of the more interesting points of the movie because I thought it would have became a lot cheaper if it became like, this girl knew how Lydia Tarr was. She infiltrated the orchestra so she could take her down from the inside. Like, that would have made it a way worse movie. And I thought it was just, it helped play into that subtlety of the movie of just, like, it's not even mentioned, you know? It ne- it's not a big dramatic scene between the two characters of, like, no, I don't want to do this. Like, it's just, it never even goes there. But it's just, it's shown in a, yeah, like a, a subtle way. I think that, again, because you called her the boomer in this movie, she takes such a perfect representation of when a girl her age would feel about the situation 
She did not care about composers of anything. She didn't know names of anything. She knew one celloist and she based her whole thing off of YouTube. So again, it's kind of contradicting the traditional norms that someone like Lydia Tarr would establish and became known for. Questions everything she knows about what it means to be, you know, a, a genius. Like, she's like, oh, which one? This young you? girl is. And it, it isn't because of uh, Mahler and Leonard Bernstein and doing everything this way, the right way. Nope. No, like this girl is just... I saw, yeah, I saw one celloist and now I'm fucking sick. I replayed <laughs> it. This I, is my life. Yeah. I, I listened to it live. Rec the recording of it off of YouTube it wasn't even found in any record. It was just one thing that celloist had done on YouTube and she played it over and over again. And that opened her up to doing everything else. But her only interest was to play the cello. And I think it's, it's, it's the perfect character because that's all she's interested about when they, she does take her to be her bag girl or whatever. She's talking to boys, you know, she's living her life. She's kind of like, oh, I'm here on my own accord because all my all I'm thinking about is being in the cello. So everything else that Lydia Tarr might be throwing at her, she just doesn't care for. And she doesn't care about the same things that she cares about. And I think that's where Lydia Tarr's character starts to also kind of, I guess, mentally be prepared for the downfall because she starts to realize the things that she cares about on a regular basis or for most people don't matter that much and yeah. it might mean a lot for the same way you know i don't know why we kind of chose as him to comparison but i think somebody who's openly as like as shitty as it's like kanye right is kind of always thinking the stuff that they care about is the only thing that's the coolest or whatever and her being shown a character who isn't even aware that she's in the middle of this most stressful might maybe being canceled just kind of really represents how somebody that age would not even really know what the fuck is going on with Lydia Tarr's life because I don't care. Yeah, like, uh, you're old plus L plus racial. Yeah, Bye. like, that's cool <laughs> that you brought me along, but I don't like, who are you? Yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, the life is really starting to unravel slowly. Um, I did want to, you know, start wrapping it up. Mm -hmm. um, all of this kind of comes to a head with a deposition and um, Lydia Tarr losing her spot as the, as the um, conductor of the Berlin Orchestra. Uh, she, her one freak out there will be blood moment is that she rushes the stage and attacks, uh, Elliot. Uh, we mentioned him earlier, the, the businessman slash conductor who was played by Mark Strong. See, they gave him his chance as uh, soon as she was gone. He yeah, was, they, the next he one. got the chance, you know, so he, he was there. He played his cards, right? The, like, I'm going to replace her one day. Uh, <laughs> and it's not like, it's not like she didn't know that, you know, that mm -hmm. was very upfront. Um, you know, she freaks out. She kind of beats the shit out of him. Yeah. And she, the, the canceling has, has fully taken place. You know, she's no longer, um, she's no longer a conductor and she's been publicly shamed. Her wife leaves. And yeah, her wife leaves. And now she's gonna, she has to go on a, a journey of like, I wouldn't even say redemption, but she has to get away from all of this. And she goes to what I believe is like Thailand. I think it's Thailand. Well, first it's it's where we find out where she really. Oh yeah, from. she goes home. She's Linda Tartellini from Staten Island. Lydia Tar is a fucking fake name that she to to make herself feel like she's fancier than she really she's is. She's a Rangers fan, you know, guy. She's a Linda. She ain't a Lydia. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tar with two R's, not whatever that thing is over the. End, <laughs> R, you know? like, I told Alvaro that before we were recording this, like you know, when the movie started, I assumed like, oh, she must have went to these fancy schools. She probably comes from a lot of money. They put a violin in her hand when she's five years old you know what i mean no she's linda tar from staten island you know what i mean like she'd fit more in in an episode of like the sopranos than she would in a <laughs> amadeus you know what like, I mean? wow <laughs> which is just completely just not something you would expect like you said even the and i think that's what's interesting to me is the poster kind of is making fun of what you would think the movie is you know once you've seen it i see it being like she looks so majestic and it's it's just all a facade it's all fake she's not a genius she's not a fucking good person all of this is being just like propped up like this is really a movie too about like the brand yeah you know what i mean like this is a this is saying something about what it means now like with this idea of people being brands and not just artists or whatever tar yeah tar like you know, you know, tar on tar. yeah you know tar on tar yeah <laughs> but you know she she um takes her time she goes to another country which i believe i think is thailand. i think it's thailand yeah. you know and we get to we <laughs> we see like a final moment of what might be what might be regret I turns into really memoria huh to take it yeah i know i joked i was like is this memoria uh, <laughs> uh she goes to get a massage right and she sees she she 
turns out to go to a brothel, which I don't think she understood was where she was going to end up. And I thought it was interesting that the women were all set up in a way that looked like the orchestra. And if you, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but the woman that she picks was the same seat that Olga and before that Krista had sat in. So it's like, that's why she goes out there and like feels sick. And like, it's that final moment of kind of like letting go of everything ju- that just happened. Really? Yeah. No, I, n- I noticed that they were positioned that way, but I thought that she just felt bad because they were all like underage. No, I like don't think that, someone like Lydia Tar probably even cared about at that. At the honestly. thought, yeah. I honestly think it was because like it just reminded that look of the orchestra, the woman that she picked, and it was like that's the the seat, you know. Like it's just this deep seated like subconscious thing that like made her fucking so disgusted with herself that she went out there and puked. You know what I mean? And uh, the movie's kind of got a weird ending because we have this slight moment of like peace and serenity where she's at this waterfall. And then we, you know, we get our final shot of, so what the hell happened to Lydia Tarr? Because you do, I mean, you do see that she has actively, because she's in a new country, she's actively working again. So you would assume, be like, I guess she's reestablishing herself. She has to go somewhere where nobody she cares. She Polanski'd it? Yeah, yeah. She, she, has to, she has to go somewhere where nobody cares what she yeah. did. Everybody does this on a Monday and a Tuesday. Yeah. So that's just, you're you're a good person if that's yeah, all you do. about all that stuff. Like, that, yeah. That's all you do? Yeah. Um, oh. So <laughs> I'd be like, Okay, anyway. Sexual abuse is wrong. In fact, the there's brothels States? here. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So I think um that's what's interesting is you kind of kind of what you're saying, you get this this what seems like yeah, she might be in a rougher place. Or she's not in Berlin anymore, but she's reestablishing herself. They're bringing her flowers cuz composer, you know, she's really good. And then you kind of go what you're saying to one of these final shots where it looks like okay, I'm in front of an orchestra again and she looks just as stressed as she was when she was with the Berlin orchestra, you know? And it kind of just throws you <laughs> off because i mean i'll let you finish but i thought that so was so we we see this final orchestra performance like oh shit here we go we're finally gonna maybe get a performance because um you had asked me before the pod if you're like is this a musical movie and no it's not it's about the world of music but um performances you don't even get any of those it cuts before any performance actually starts and then the actual musical rehearsals and practice is nothing but lydia tar stop you it. know just going on about her own genius and how she needs it to be this way, how she needs it to be this way, and it needs to be pop, 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 not da, da, da. You know, like, it's just, it's her being a control freak, so you never really get to hear any music, but then now you're at this final performance, you're wondering, what the hell am I going to see? And it pans out, a video starts, and you realize she's at a Monster Hunter convention. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, The score to the latest Monster Hunter game. She's officially as low as she could be as a composer. No offense to video game composers. Shout out Halo 3. Shout out Persona 5. Yeah, is this this is for someone who was at the highest level. Mm-hmm. This is why I met Barry Lyndon. You know, it, the the rise and fall of Linda Tardellini. <laughs> no, but like, your genius won't let you let go of it. But you also be like, look how how have you fallen, my boy. Wow, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah. the movie's fucking over, and it was really like a not a gut punch because, like I'm saying, this movie, it, the way it was made, cannot elicit these emotions out of me. But you know, if I was if if I was to feel something. <laughs> wow, that would have felt like a gut punch. <laughs> you know what I mean? So that's fucking tar. Uh, I really fucking enjoyed this movie. It, the more uh, I've had time to sit and think on it and the notes I've made, uh, just the interviews and everything I, everything that was leading up into this podcast, like I liked this movie a lot more than I thought I did as we walked out those doors. So I don't have anything else to say really except for you got to go fucking see this movie. This is a great fucking film. If you're looking for some uh, adult movies, <laughs> you know, this is this is proudly uh, a movie for grownups. You know, like I don't think it's trying to appeal to anyone other than cinephiles. Yeah. And definitely. I, I think it, it has stuff for older generations and even the younger generation. I know it might be it's runtime might be seen as a negative thing for some people. Um, they're like, I'll watch this when it's at home and maybe that'll be so, but I do hope that if you are listening to this episode, you're at least, we've at least interested you to check it out. Um, I do think this will get a couple of Oscars definitely nominated, no doubt there, but I do think, um, it's worth checking out if you're a, if you've always enjoyed Kate Blanchett's work, she really shows off her prowess here. And like you said before, I do hope that we don't get another 15 year hiatus from Todd Field. Or maybe we'll get more cool stories of him doing some other cool stuff. So, yeah, but I mean, 
I'm just I I need more of this, you know, more good movies from good movie makers. You yeah, know? Exactly. I don't think that's crazy to ask, you know. <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I think that's what got lost in my Wakanda Forever rant. <laughs> Why can this not be good? You know. <laughs> but anyways, uh, that that concludes our tar right. episode. You know, I hope you uh, I hope you learned something, man. Don't be a fucking asshole. You won't get canceled. You know, be a good person. Rat on rat. Rat on rat. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, man, thanks for checking back into the Grand Cinema Hotel. Like, subscribe, comment, share the show, do all the shit. You work for us. Promote this shit. Yep. Goodbye. See ya. Yeah.